Thank you very much. Good morning, everyone. I'm Deborah Goldman, the Executive Director of the Legal Resource Center on Violence Against Women, and I'm here today with Amy Lewis, our Project Coordinator. We want to thank you for joining us this morning for our webinar on interstate custody and domestic violence issues. And especially, we're grateful for all you do every day to help domestic violence survivors. We have many attorneys and advocates on the line today from across the country, and we know that many of you have had questions from survivors about whether or not they can move across state or tribal lines with their children. We imagine that you see the same types of cases that we hear about daily when we talk to survivors. So you may hear from a domestic violence survivor who has taken the children out of state to protect herself or the children, or is considering relocating. On the other hand, you may hear from survivors when the other parent, the perpetrator, has taken the children across state lines in order to punish the former victim. Perhaps the perpetrator has disappeared with the children, or perhaps the perpetrator is holding the children over in violation of an existing custody or visitation order. And finally, you may encounter cases where protection orders have been entered by a court in one state and a custody order has been entered by a court in a different state, and perhaps the two judges have entered conflicting orders. So we're going to touch on all those types of situations today. I want to also thank NCJFCJ for hosting this training. Before we dive into the legal issues, Amy is going to share with you a bit how we can support your practice and your work with survivors. Thanks, Deborah. So a little bit about what we do here at the LRC. Some of you may have heard of us, um, but we focus on cases where there's a history of domestic violence, of course, and where there's an interstate custody matter. And primarily, we can help you understand the state and federal laws that are implicated when survivors are thinking about crossing state lines. So we conduct in-person and webinar training such as this one. We also have a hotline that operates during business hours, and that number is going to be on your second to last slide. We talk by phone every day with professionals across the country who have questions on the laws involved in these types of cases, including attorneys and advocates. And we can certainly always provide attorneys with sample pleadings and case law and help strategize about cases. We also have written resources in terms of our website where you can find relevant state laws, uh, where we've just recently updated some of the relocation laws on that site. Of course, we always encourage survivors to consult with an attorney even if they are looking at those laws. Um, but you can definitely use those as a starting point. We have case law summaries and checklists, including the FAQs for advocates that you see available for download here, and checklists for survivors in Spanish and English. Um, for survivors, when there's a jurisdictional question, we can help them sometimes find an attorney by using our database of attorneys and programs across the country. And of course, feel free to refer survivors to us if their cases meet kind of the following three criteria, like I said before, where there's a history of domestic violence, it involves the child custody matter, and where there is uh, more than one state or tribal jurisdiction involved. So as Deborah kind of stated, most of the cases that we see referred to the LRC are because a survivor is either thinking of fleeing the state with her children or has already fled the state with her children to escape the abuse. We um, do, are not able to handle international cases unless there's some overlap with the UCCJEA, which is a law that we'll discuss um, further. And we do not represent survivors directly, but of course if the case does involve these types of jurisdictional issues, we can try to connect them with an attorney in the appropriate state. Um, we also do not handle criminal matters, and in some instances, a survivor may need a criminal defense attorney as well as a civil attorney, and we would direct that survivor to uh, talk with their public defender's office or our sister organization, the National Clearinghouse for the Defense of Battered Women, which is also um, referenced on one of your later slides. So we're going to move on and start with a case scenario that's going to kind of set up the outline for how we're going to talk about these laws. And in this particular case, you see that Lila Smith has called you at your office in Nashville, 
and she's calling from her car while dri driving to pick up Philip Smith, her husband, from work, and so she only has five minutes to talk. And in that conversation, you find out Lila and Philip have been married for five years, and they've lived in Nashville throughout their marriage. They only have one child, their seventh-month-old daughter named Annie. Philip has been physically and emotionally abusive to Lila since shortly after they were married, but he's never been charged or convicted criminally for the abuse. And Lila has never sought a protection order against him. Um, Lila thinks a neighbor may have heard the abuse, though, including a recent incident, which took place last week. And during that incident, Philip held a gun to her head in front of Annie and threatened to kill her. So now Lila is telling you she wants to leave Nashville and move to California where her family lives and where she hopes to find a job. So you invite Lila to come into your office and discuss her case. So Deborah's going to talk to you a little bit about what some of the issues involved in relocation tend to come up are. Thank you, Amy. So our fact pattern with Lila is probably very familiar to those of you who work daily with survivors. Often there's a long and extensive history of violence, but very little documentation. No criminal convictions, no protection orders, not a lot for a judge to go on when Lila is going to be presenting evidence of the domestic violence. And yet these cases, as you advocates all know, where survivors are trying to leave a particular state where they've been isolated from family and friends and go back to a different part of the country where they have supportive family, sometimes increased employment opportunities, it's really critical for them to be able to leave with the children and rebuild their lives in a different setting. So here's some information about how you can help when a survivor comes to you and talks about this case. And the bottom line is it's really critical for survivors to be able to consult directly with knowledgeable attorneys back in the state that they are planning to leave, even before they leave the state. As you'll see from our discussion today, there's so many legal issues that can be triggered by crossing a state or tribal line with children that it's critical to get accurate legal advice before making a decision about relocating. So we're just going to introduce you to a couple of the major legal issues to start out with. First of all, there's always a question as to whether or not a custody order has already been entered previously. In our fact pattern with Lila, we've said that there has not been a custody order, but in many real-life situations, either the survivor or the perpetrator may have previously obtained a temporary or final custody order from a court, including perhaps a custody provision within a protection order. The reason this matters so much is because a survivor is going to have a more difficult time leaving if there's a custody or visitation order in effect that gives the perpetrator some type of joint custody or some type of visitation back in the home state. So the bottom line issue would be, can the survivor leave without violating an existing court order? It may be that the survivor needs to return to court and try and get a custody or visitation order modified before leaving the state. One of the issues that can come up is a survivor may potentially be charged with contempt if she's in violation of either a visitation provision or a joint custody or a custody provision within a court order. The other issue that comes up is a separate legal issue, and that has to do with what do the criminal laws say in the state that she wishes to leave. We'll talk a bit more towards the end of our time with you today about parental kidnapping laws, also sometimes known as custodial interference laws, but every state has its own specific state law that governs whether it's legal for a parent to take the children out of state. Sometimes, if there has never been a custody order entered, a parent is perfectly free to take the children across state lines, as long as the parent is not concealing or hiding the children from the other parent. In other states, the state parental kidnapping laws are more restrictive, and it may be more difficult for a parent, even in the absence of a custody order, to take the children out of state. 
So as advocates, one thing that's very important is for you to connect with attorneys in your state and to find out what the parental kidnapping laws say for your own information. Then if a survivor comes to you, you'll be able to connect the survivor with an attorney who can give good legal advice about parental kidnapping. Another legal issue that comes up, separate and apart from the parental kidnapping laws, is what does the state relocation law say? So in Lila's situation, she would consult with an attorney in Tennessee to find out both what the parental kidnapping law says in Tennessee and also whether or not there's a state relocation law in Tennessee. As you'll see towards the end of our discussion today, the relocation laws are very, very different from state to state, but increasingly, most of the states at this point have a relocation law in place. In many states, they only go into play after someone already has obtained a custody order. And typically, they would set forth the criteria that the custodial parent needs to meet before moving out of state. So we'll talk more about that issue later today. Another legal issue that comes up when a survivor is thinking about leaving the state is are there going to be any immigration-related consequences to leaving the state? And we mentioned just a couple of those here today. First of all, if there's a survivor who is concerned about her immigration status, then it's particularly important for her not to end up with a conviction for parental kidnapping. Many times, if there's a conviction on someone's record, that can be important to an immigration law case and to removal proceedings. So particularly important with immigrant survivors to make sure that there's not going to be a parental kidnapping charge. The other important thing that comes up when a survivor is an immigrant is, is that survivor going to be able to access certain forms of immigration relief? Right now, the federal laws do include several forms of immigration relief for battered immigrants. So it may be a survivor, for example, who wants to apply for self-petition under the Violence Against Women Act. It may be a survivor who's eligible for a U visa, also under VAWA. It may be someone who is trying to access what's called a battered spouse waiver in a different type of immigration case. In all of those situations, the immigration relief will turn on whether or not the survivor has been a victim of domestic violence and whether or not the immigration judges are going to believe that there's been that history of domestic violence. So if that was Lila's situation, it could be very important for her to file for a protection order in Tennessee before leaving the state. That could be something then that could be attached as attached to an application, for example, for a self-petition under the Violence Against Women Act, one of the forms of immigration relief I mentioned. So particularly in those types of cases, be aware that these interstate issues may be even more complex. In all of these situations, whether or not there's an immigration law component, the question frequently comes up whether or not a survivor like Lila should file for for a protection order before leaving the state. And in just a moment, I'll share with you some of the pros and cons to filing for a protection order in the home state, and in Lila's case, the state of Tennessee. Another issue that sometimes comes up is the issue of personal jurisdiction in the refuge state. So if someone like Lila is going to move from Tennessee far across the country to the state of California, she may be thinking about whether she should get a protection order in the original state of Tennessee or whether she should wait till she gets to California and file for a protection order there. And in just a couple of moments, we'll talk about this issue of personal jurisdiction, which has to do with whether or not the California court, the court in the refuge state, is able legally to enter a protection order out over a respondent like Philip. One of the major legal issues we're going to discuss with you today is the next point, and that is, are the child custody jurisdictional laws 
going to require someone like Lila to return to the original state in order to litigate the case. As you'll see, many times when domestic violence survivors are thinking about leaving the state, the UCCJEA, or related law, may end up meaning that they have a custody case back in the home state, the very state that they were trying to escape. So we'll talk more about that and how the courts have been handling these cases realistically in a few minutes. And finally, there's the issue of continuing exclusive jurisdiction. What that means is, is the state that entered the original custody order going to be able to modify that custody order, or could another state do so? The bottom line is, in most cases, the state that originally entered a custody order is going to have to modify it. So that may influence someone like Lila when she is thinking about leaving the state. So we're going to continue to address many of these legal issues that we flagged for you here over the next hour as we continue with our webinar. Right now, we're going to move to the very specific question of, should Lila get a protection order before moving? So all of you advocates who are on the line are probably pretty familiar with your protection order laws in your states and how useful they can be to domestic violence survivors. The same is true for survivors who are thinking of relocating. There can be many benefits to filing for a protection order before leaving. The first benefit could be that protection orders typically will decrease the amount of physical violence in many relationships by deterring the perpetrator from committing future violence, at least while the protection order is in effect. Additionally, because of the Violence Against Women Act, protection orders are enforceable across the country. So if Lila gets a protection order in Tennessee and then at a later point moves to California or elsewhere, the new state is going to need to enforce that protection order against Philip. Additionally, it can be useful to get a protection order because that is one way to document that there has been a history of domestic violence. As we mentioned with this fact pattern, there's not a whole lot of documentation right now. And yet, Lila may have a need to prove to the courts later on that she is a victim of domestic violence and that Philip is the perpetrator. For example, in almost every state, domestic violence is going to be relevant to a long-term custody case. But I'm sure many of you have seen sometimes Courts in, in family cases are looking for a high level of documentation of the violence. So getting a protection order in Tennessee at an early point may also help down the road when Lila is trying to make a custody argument. It can also help with some of the jurisdictional arguments we're going to share with you today, many of which are based on whether or not a judge believes that there's been a history of domestic violence. So getting a protection order in place can also be helpful for jurisdictional arguments. Additionally, as many of you know, sometimes perpetrators threaten to take the children from the survivor if the survivor leaves the relationship. And sometimes they do so in a physical way, sometimes they do so by filing uh, custody cases or ex parte orders and that type of thing. If someone like Lila gets a protection order back in the home state, in the vast majority of states, the protection orders can include temporary custody. So if Lila is concerned that Philip is going to try and take Annie from her, getting a protection order in place with temporary custody of Annie can be very useful to deterring the future violence and the other methods of control involving the child. Finally, as we'll talk about a bit later today, someone like Lila may not be able to get a protection order in the new state. So this might be her one chance to get a protection order, doing so before leaving the home state. And we'll talk more about personal jurisdiction and, and the hurdle that poses sometimes to getting a protection order in the refuge state. There may be other reasons as well. At least a handful of protection order laws require the violence to have taken place in the state in order to get a protection order in that state. So there may be, uh, there may be legal reasons why someone like Lila could not get a protection order in the new state, in this case California, 
So that too would be a reason to get a protection order before leaving. Now we're going to turn to some of the risks of getting a protection order in this type of interstate case. And these may be risks that are not present at all when you think about survivors who don't want to leave the home state. So we'll walk through them. The very first one, and the one that comes up most frequently, is what if the abuser, someone like Philip, is awarded some type of visitation as part of the protection order? When we do trainings with attorneys and inquire about their real life practice in protection order cases, we find that many times if a judge is going to enter a temporary custody order as part of a protection order, the judge also is going to award some type of visitation, whether it's supervised or unsupervised, to the respondent in that case. So if Lila goes in Tennessee and files for protection order, and gets temporary custody of Lila, but the judge also awards some type of visitation to Philip, that will make it impossible for her to leave the state at that point. So that's one of the biggest reasons to hesitate before filing for a protection order back in the home state if the survivor is planning to leave and going to be able to leave under the criminal laws. There are some other legal issues that come up as well certain types of laws that we're going to talk about today, like parental kidnapping laws or state relocation laws, in some states are only triggered after there's been a custody order entered. But that includes custody orders that are part of protection orders. So someone like Lila might be better off not filing for a protection order, not getting temporary custody before leaving, because it will mean that she does not have to address further legal complications under the state parental kidnapping or relocation law. Similarly, we're going to talk today about something called an inconvenient form argument, which is a legal argument to the judge in the home state asking that judge to transfer custody over a particular child to transfer a custody case to the refuge state. One of the factors that a judge has to look at is whether or not the home state already is familiar with the parties and the issues. So by filing for a protection order in the home state, Lila actually could be taking a step that would make it harder to get a custody judge down the road to transfer the long-term custody case out of the state. So we're not suggesting that in an interstate case or a case where a survivor wants to relocate that no one should ever file for a protection order, but we just want to make sure that you're aware that there's a range of legal issues and factual issues to be considered first. If someone like Lila could get a protection order that didn't include custody or visitation, there's not really much of a drawback to getting that type of protection order in the home state. It would document the violence, but it would not trigger all those other issues um, that having a custody provision in a protection order can do. So think this through if you're attorneys with your clients and if you're advocates, um, think this through as well and, and refer your clients to attorneys who can advise them about this particular issue. Now we're going to turn for a moment to the safety and economic issues in relocation. We're sure that those of you on the line are, are quite familiar with these. So just briefly, some things to consider um, as Lila is thinking about leaving the state, in addition to the legal issues, um, is to consider whether or not she's actually going to have a safe place to go in the refuge state. Oftentimes, survivors contact us because they have family in another state, but if that's not the case, thinking about whether there's going to be shelter available to her. Um, is she going to be able to survive economically and be able to get assistance in the new state, uh, whether that's child care, government benefits, specifically legal assistance, sometimes um, depending on a particular legal services organization, it may be difficult for a survivor to get legal services in the new state if they haven't been there very long, or um, it may then also be difficult for them to get legal services in the state they fled because um, they're no longer in the home state. When she's fleeing, thinking about um, whose name the cars might be in or if she has access, if everything's in the perpetrator's name, 
um, if they're not married or if they are, what legal issues might be surrounding that and taking certain types of property out of the state. Um, taking any legal documents with her um, that she might need for a case, including any birth certificates, any past protection orders or custody orders, any documentation of the violence that she might have had with her, uh, pictures, past phones, things like that. Thinking about police responsiveness and the court responsiveness in the new state, if she's going from a very resource intense area to a very resource limited area, and whether or not the court or the police are likely to be more or less responsive to domestic violence in those areas, or if there are just enough resources in the area to which she's going. So all of these things are certainly things to consider beyond the legal ramifications when she's thinking about relocating and um, to consider when she's thinking about her safety. Thank you. So now we're going to turn back to the issue of federal and state laws. And we're going to share with you what we sometimes refer to as alphabet soup. Many of these federal laws have acronyms. So to start off with the Violence Against Women Act, most of you are familiar with this law. It's a very broad law that was first enacted in 1994 and then reauthorized in 2000, 2005, and 2013. The Violence Against Women Act funds many programs under which many of you attorneys and advocates are supported to do your jobs. That's one big piece of it. Additionally, there's some interstate provisions with which you may not be as familiar. So for example, the Violence Against Women Act sets forth some federal crimes that did not exist before 1994. One of those is an interstate domestic violence crime. Another is an interstate stalking crime. And a third is an interstate violation of a protection order crime. So those are all federal crimes now under the Violence Against Women Act. Additionally, the Violence Against Women Act has a particular provision referred to as the full faith and credit provision. And what that says is that protection orders that are issued properly by one state have to be enforced across the country. Similarly, tribal orders that are entered appropriately by tribes have to be enforced by states across the country. And that was a new change to federal law that meant that protection orders had to be enforced everywhere. And we've seen varying success with that happening uh, in practice. One of the questions that's been submitted to us through the public chat is what is the way that a new state can enforce protection orders if a protection order was entered by a different state. And that is going to vary from state to state. The basic rule is that however that enforcing state enforces protection orders that are entered by its own judges, that is the same method that should be used to enforce a protection order that comes from a different state. So for example, if you're in Washington, D.C., where you have a couple of different ways to enforce protection orders, one of them is by a contempt order. Actually, it's unusual because a, a private person can bring that in D.C. Um, or it can be through a criminal case, a violation of a protection order case. The same would be true if somebody brought a protection order from Oklahoma to Washington, D.C. and asked for enforcement of it. It should be the same mechanism. Turning now to the next federal law on your slide, the Parental Kidnapping Prevention Act, the PKPA. Although its name suggests that it might involve federal parental kidnapping crimes, it actually does not. This federal law is another type of full faith and credit law that says that states have to honor and enforce custody orders that were entered by sister states. That's why if someone like Philip files in Tennessee and gets custody of Annie, even if Lila flees to California, the state of California ultimately is going to have to enforce the custody order that was entered back in Tennessee. And that's because of this federal law, the PKPA. The PKPA, we've also learned recently, is relevant to these interstate cases when there are territories, such as Puerto Rico, that have not adopted some of the state laws we'll talk about in a moment. 
So Puerto Rico does not have the UCCJA or the UCCJEA, which I'll describe shortly. So in that particular territory, what governs these types of interstate issues is the federal law, the PKPA. Now we're going to turn for a moment to a different federal law, and that is called ICWA, or the Indian Child Welfare Act. ICWA was enacted in 1978 to protect Indian children and to promote the stability and security of Indian tribes and families. What it does is it establishes some minimum federal standards for the removal of Indian children from their families and grants tribes exclusive jurisdiction in certain types of defined child custody proceedings. So ICWA does not apply to protection order cases or to custody cases between two biological parents. Rather, it applies to things like foster care placement, termination of parental rights, pre-adoptive placement and post-adoptive placement proceedings, essentially proceedings where the state is getting involved in this type of case. If ICWA applies, it means that a particular uniform state law, the UCCJEA, does not apply. Now we're going to turn to some of the state and tribal laws that are involved, and again, we don't expect you to memorize all the different alphabet soup terminology. We just want you to understand that there are a range of different federal and state laws that are involved in these types of interstate cases. So turning to the state laws, the UCCJA, the Uniform Child Custody Jurisdiction Act, is the old version of, the, of a uniform code. It was developed in 1968, and it's purpose was to figure out which state should be involved in a custody proceeding over certain children. However, the UCCJEA did not really establish enough of a bright line rule to make it easy for the courts or the parties in these types of custody cases. What happened under the UCCJA was that more than one court could conceivably have jurisdiction. So one court could be in a home state, and that would be fine under the UCCJA. Another court could have a significant connection to the family, and that would also be valid under the UCCJA. So you would have courts from different states getting involved in custody cases, properly entering custody orders, but then you'd end up with a conflict between the custody orders because the UCCJA did not establish any type of hierarchy for what's the, what's the final answer as to which state can exercise jurisdiction. That was fixed when the UCCJEA came along. It was developed by the National Conference of Commissioners on Uniform State Laws back in 1997. And the major change that they made was they created a hierarchy where the home state court has preferred jurisdiction over any other states. I'll talk about what that means in just a moment. In addition to the UCCJA and the UCCJEA, there are also other types of state and tribal laws. One such law is a full faith and credit statute. Now, just a moment ago, I mentioned there's a federal law that VAWA has a full faith and credit provision. That is true, but also many states have what's called full faith and credit enabling legislation. So they add a little bit of detail to this concept that the federal law set forth, saying that protection orders have to be enforced across state lines. They might um, answer specifically the question that was raised by a participant here as to how exactly do I go about enforcing a protection order from out of state. So you can take a look at your state full faith and credit statute and get information about that. Some tribal communities also in their codes have enacted full faith and credit legislation. Many of you on the line are familiar with this next bullet, state or tribal protection order laws. All states now have a protection order code, and while there are many similarities across states, there are also some differences. We include this in a list of jurisdictional statutes because your state jurisdictional law, your, I'm sorry, your state protection order law is going to say whether or not a particular situation makes a survivor eligible to get a protection order. 
So in some states, for example, they're starting to look at um, types of behavior like maybe emotional coercion or threats, while in other states they have uh, protection order laws that define eligibility as whether or not certain crimes have been committed against a family member. So your state protection order statutes are also going to be important in determining whether or not someone like Lila can get a protection order in the home state of Tennessee or the refuge state, in this case, California. And finally, we just want to remind everyone on the line that state relocation and parental kidnapping laws also come into play. They're not specifically jurisdictional laws, but they do play a large role in these sorts of interstate cases where survivors are thinking about fleeing across state lines. And now we're going to move along and talk more about the UCCJEA. So I mentioned that it was developed in 1997 and that it was meant to put this hierarchy in place where the home state trumps other jurisdictions in terms of getting to be involved in a child custody matter. At this point, 49 states, the outlier being Massachusetts, which has not adopted it yet, as well as D.C., Guam, and the Virgin Islands all have enacted the UCCJEA. So if you've got it in your state, it's going to look very similar to the UCCJEA in another state. Let's say you're working with a survivor who has come from another state. The UCCJEA has a lot of improvements for domestic violence survivors, and that's because advocates from the battered women's movement submitted uh, comments to the commissioners who were developing it and included some information about why in so many of these highly contested interstate cases, what was really going on was a background of domestic violence. And that was what was prompting people to flee across state lines and fear for their lives or to protect their children. Two of the major uh, improvements in the UCCJEA we're going to talk about today. One of them is that the refuge state in our fact pattern that would be California can enter an emergency custody order. And that's something we'll give you more detail about in a few minutes. The other major improvement was that the home state can now, um, the, there are mandated factors that a court in the home state has to consider when someone asks the judge in the home state to decline jurisdiction based on inconvenient forum. And one of those is safety and domestic violence. So now it's very explicit that those two improvements are part of the UCCJEA. For those of you who are attorneys on the line, we can try and help you by giving you sample pleadings or talking you through these cases. For those of you who are advocates, you may get questions from people who flee to your state saying, is there anything I can do about custody right now? Um, often survivors we talk to have been told they can't do anything for six months, but that is not the case because of the emergency jurisdiction provision within the UCCJEA. And now we're going to take a look at Lila's situation. We imagine that you see a lot of these questions, which we hear as well. Can Lila get a custody order in Tennessee? What happens if she's forced to return to Tennessee to litigate the case? What about parental kidnapping? Can Lila get a custody order in California if she leaves Tennessee with the children? Is it even legal for Lila to leave the state with her children? So for the rest of our time here, we're going to try and walk you through these types of questions, which we imagine are similar to what you may hear in your own practice. Number one, can Lila get a custody order in Tennessee? This raises the very basic question of jurisdiction. Does Tennessee have jurisdiction over the custody case? And we have for you here a ladder that sets out the jurisdictional hierarchy. I'm going to walk you through it one piece at a time. But the bottom line is, yes, Tennessee can enter a custody order because Tennessee is what's called the home state in Lila's situation. So some of you may have already heard about the home state. That's sometimes known as the six-month rule. And the home state is specifically defined as the state in which a child lived with a parent or a person acting as a parent for at least six consecutive months before the commencement of a child custody proceeding. Commencement is defined under the UCCJEA 
as the first time that one of the parties files for custody. So it's not when the other party gets served. It's not when a court enters a custody order. The date that's important is when the first parent files for custody. So that's the point at which you look at and say, has the child been living somewhere for six months? OK, then you have a home state. There's also a quirk in this home state rule, and that's sometimes known as the extended home state. That comes into play all the time for survivors who want to leave the state. And what it says is that if there's a home state, that state is going to keep jurisdiction over a child custody issue for at least six months after one parent removes the children from the state. Meaning that if Lila takes Annie to California, Philip has a six-month window during which time he can file back in the state of Tennessee. And if he does that, Tennessee is going to be exercising jurisdiction, and whatever happens in Tennessee is going to be good all over the country. So a lot of times we um, hear from survivors, and it's important that survivors know, even if it's legal for them to leave the state with their children, there may be this issue of the perpetrator filing for custody back in the home state. And that's why we recommend that survivors, if they leave, call back to the family court in the county that they've left about once a week for the next six months. It's really important for them to call the court directly. They don't have to say anything other than their names and the, ch and the child's father's name and the children's names, and find out if indeed the perpetrator has filed back in the home state. Likely, the perpetrator is not going to notify them if the perpetrator files for custody. And it's so important for the survivor to be involved. If the survivor finds out because of calls to the family court during that six-month period that something's been filed in the home state, then the survivor should be involved in that case, either trying to participate by telephone in the court proceedings, if the judge in the home state will allow it, or coming back in person. Um, to participate in those court proceedings. The reason is, without information from the survivor about the history of domestic violence and the context of the interstate flight, it's possible that a judge in the home state would give custody just to the perpetrator, like Philip. And then it's going to be very difficult to unravel that type of custody order. So please recommend, if you're talking to survivors who have come to your state and you know that they've left a different state, recommend that they call back and see what's happening. Has anyone filed for custody back in the home state that they've left? Another um, quirk that comes up with the home state rule is there's a special rule when the, child, when the child is less than six months old. And in that case, the home state is defined as the state in which the child lived from birth with any of the persons mentioned. So if you're an attorney and you have a case involving a child who's less than six months old, we've got some case law on what that means, feel free to give us a call and we'll walk you through it. And finally, the last nuance of the home state definition that I want to mention today is that a period of temporary absence does not deprive the home state from being the home state. What I mean by that is if Tennessee is the home state in, in the case of Lila's daughter, Annie, but Annie has spent a couple weeks during the summer visiting with grandparents in California, that is not going to take away from Tennessee its status as the home state. Children are allowed to leave the state for a certain amount of time, a temporary absence, and the home state still gets to be the home state. This um, issue of temporary absence comes up a lot in cases involving military families. And there's a fair amount of case law about what that means, temporary absence in the context of a military family. So feel free, again, to give us a call if that is coming up in that situation. So the next rung on the ladder is significant connection. You don't even consider whether a family has a significant connection with a state unless you've already decided there is no home state. So for example, if a child has not lived somewhere anywhere for six months recently, but maybe lived for five months in one state, four months in another state, that would be the type of situation where the significant connection jurisdictional base would be used. And what, it, what the statute says is that 
a child has a significant connection with the state if there's substantial evidence in that state and if there's a fair amount of evidence about the child's care, protection, and relationships. So for example, the types of things that judges are looking for when somebody tries to assert significant connection jurisdiction, they may be looking to see, has the child spent much time in the state? Has the child had visitation in the state? Are there relatives of the child that live in the state? Does the child have some daycare or school records in the state? Has the child visited with a pediatrician in the state? All of those types of real life factors are what can make or break a significant connection argument. Significant connection jurisdiction is the only type of case under the UCCJEA where it matters who filed first. Generally, it doesn't matter at all who filed first because the court in the home state is going to have jurisdiction over the child custody matter. So if Lila went to California and she filed something in California first, but then Philip filed back in Tennessee, Tennessee has jurisdiction because it's the extended home state. But consider a different pattern where a particular survivor has spent, let's say, time in Minnesota and time in New Jersey four months in each state, there it's going to matter which parent files first because each of those states could exercise significant connection jurisdiction. What the UCCJEA says about that is if more than one state gets involved in exercising significant connection jurisdiction, uh, it's the second state that has to put the brakes on and cannot move forward with a custody case once they know uh, that a state already is exercising significant connection jurisdiction. The next rung on the ladder is called more appropriate forum jurisdiction, and we're going to talk about that later today. This is that type of inconvenient forum argument. So basically, this rung of the ladder has to do with the situation where the court that has preferred jurisdiction, let's say the home state court, makes a decision to give it up in favor of another state. They think for whatever reason there's a more appropriate forum. That is permitted under the UCCJEA, and we'll discuss how it applies to domestic violence situations shortly. And then finally, if there is no home state, there is no significant connection state, nobody's made a decision that there's a state that's a more appropriate forum, then any old state can get involved in a custody matter. Sometimes this is called vacuum or last resort jurisdiction. That is that final rung on the ladder, the no other state issue. So now you've had a, a primer in jurisdictional basis under the UCCJEA. Now we're going to talk about some real life things that advocates can do to help back in that home state. So the primary thing that advocates can do to help is certainly finding, helping Lila find an attorney to represent her back in the home state or back in Nashville. Um, in many cases, survivors will qualify for civil legal services, and many agencies are not going to take into account the abuser's income, and some may even waive financial requirements for survivors. Um, even if the survivor is conflicted out from in-house legal services, she may be eligible for a private attorney involvement or volunteer attorney program where private attorneys take cases referred by local legal aid agencies. As advocates um, or other agencies that aren't legal services agencies, you can contact their director to see if maybe they would provide you with a list of volunteer attorneys. And you can contact those attorneys to see if they'd be willing to take pro bono cases with direct referrals from your advocacy organization. If you're working with a survivor who's fled to your state, your local legal services organization may be able to send a referral back to legal services in the home state. And some, even though some agencies may say they cannot take cases for those not living in the state, it might be helpful to stress that a matter is venued in a particular county, also stressing the severity of the abuse, or if something's already been filed in the home state by the abuser and they're represented there, or there's a pending court date. Um, developing relationships with public defenders and defense lawyers as well as prosecutors can be helpful. Um, particularly when it comes to finding out information, as Deborah spoke about before, regarding parental kidnapping laws. 
And of course, again, if somebody's been charged with parental kidnapping, you want to make sure she gets connected with a defense attorney or a public defender um, or the National Clearinghouse for the Defense Against Battered Women. In addition, you can also, um, as Debra stated, you can help Lila document some of the abuse since there are legal protections available to her when there's been a history of domestic violence, and that's going to be very relevant to protection order cases, but also the ongoing custody case and any potential jurisdictional arguments. And then in, in addition to referring the survivor to the LRC, you can also connect survivor's attorneys with the LRC. Um, we can work with them in terms of strategizing about these cases, provide sample pleadings, talk with them about the jurisdictional arguments, and of course, helping Lila develop a safety plan as we discussed earlier based on some of those safety and economic issues and relocation. So we're going to turn to whether or not Lila can get a custody order if she flees to California. So can she get a custody order in the refuge state? And really, the short answer is yes. Under the UCCJEA, even if a child hasn't been in the state for six months, court can, courts can exercise what's called temporary emergency jurisdiction. When a child is in the state, or has been abandoned, or when an emergency prote when emergency protection is necessary because the child or a sibling or parent of the child has been subject to or threatened with mistreatment or abuse. So that means that even if the child themselves wasn't necessarily the direct victim of abuse, emergency custody can still be granted to the survivor based on her being um, a victim of domestic violence. Now, emergency jurisdiction is only available if the child is physically located in the refuge state already. So not if, let's say, the survivor is trying to gain custody after she's crossed state lines but had to leave, for whatever reason, the child back in the home state with the abuser. Even if the survivor does meet all the requirements to file or seek for emergency custody, she might want to consider whether or not she should file. Um, primarily, if the perpetrator is likely to try to show up and take the child, then she might want to speak with an attorney in the refuge state about filing. If she thinks that the perpetrator is not likely to show up, um, she might consider that filing for emergency custody in the refuge state may motivate the abuser to initiate a custody filing back in the home state. So considering the pros and cons of whether or not she does want to seek emergency custody in the new state. And of course, how to file for emergency custody is going to vary by state. So one vehicle for filing for emergency custody is through a protection order, uh, though not all states will consider custody within a protection order. And to file this way, you would have to establish, or she would have to establish personal jurisdiction, meaning that there are other legal requirements that are going to be required for her to be able to file for protection order. And Deborah is going to talk about personal jurisdiction a little bit more. If she can't get a custody order through the state's uh, protective order pro process, she might be able to file under the emergency provisions of the state's domestic relation laws. But either way, she is going to be required to establish evidence of the underlying abuse. So generally, the same types of evidence that you would present when substantiating domestic violence in a custody case under the best interests of the child standard. So the biggest thing is that, like I said, this is really just a temporary order. Um, and what constitutes temporary is going to vary by state. So a temporary order is issued uh, for a specific period of time that the court considers adequate to allow a person seeking the temporary order to either obtain a permanent or long-term order from the home state or until um, a specified date that the court considers um, adequate. So to, to determine how long that temporary order is going to last, um, the judge in the home state and the judge in the refuge state sh um, should be communicating. And the US UCCJEA does mandate that judicial communication anytime there are these kind of competing orders or something that's filed in the new state when there's a custody order filed in the home state as well. Um, the parties do you have an opportunity to present facts and legal arguments? And they may allow the parties to participate in the communication, but there is not a requirement that the parties or their counsel have to be present when the judges communicate. So 
Um, there will be a record made, or there's supposed to be a record made, and the parties must be informed promptly of that communication and given access to that record. And when that communication does pl take place, um, sometimes the parties are participating simultaneously. Sometimes they have an opportunity to be heard in advance. So that could be through either oral or written motion in advance. And like they said, sometimes parties or their attorneys are allowed to be on the phone, but that is not necessarily required. So the biggest thing is to remember that temporary emergency custody is available if the survivor has been in a state less than six months. Um, it is available to her immediately, but like I said, it is temporary, and it does not transfer or take jurisdiction away from the home state. So we do find that judges can be fairly willing to entertain temporary custody awards, particularly if it's made clear that they're not wrestling jurisdiction from another court. So in Lila's scenario, it's important to keep in mind that even though Lila can get an emergency order, in California, if she's been there less than six months, as long as Tennessee retains jurisdiction, uh, any orders that are issued from Tennessee are ultimately going to trump California's temporary emergency order because Tennessee continues to be the home state and have that long-term custody jurisdiction. So Deb is going to speak with you a little bit more about uh, personal jurisdiction and what the requirements are there. Thank you. So as Amy made clear, emergency jurisdiction permits someone in the refuge state to get emergency custody of a child, even if that child just arrived that day in the new state. Sometimes the vehicle for getting emergency custody is through a protection order proceeding. And that was something that the drafters of the UCCJEA envisioned and thought would work well. However, when it comes to protection orders in the new state, there's an additional legal issue. Besides the emergency custody, which is taken care of by the UCCJEA, there's an issue of personal jurisdiction over the perpetrator. And what that means is that the protection order judge in the new state has to have the legal authority to enter an order out over the respondent. And that turns on whether or not the new state has minimum contacts with the respondent. So in our situation, does Philip have minimum contacts with the state of California? And the types of things that we look at in determining whether or not a perpetrator has minimum contacts with the new state are pretty basic. Has the perpetrator ever been to that state? Has the perpetrator lived in that state or had some business dealings in the state? Has the perpetrator perhaps called or increasingly texted or emailed the survivor knowing that the survivor was in that new state and made threats to her? Has the perpetrator stalked her in the new state? All of those types of behaviors can give rise to minimum contacts and enough that the judge in the new state is able to exercise personal jurisdiction over the respondent and get involved in a protection order proceeding. Please feel free to call us if you have issues about personal jurisdiction over a respondent in the refuge state. There are a handful of states that are going a different route in their protection order laws, and they're starting to require, in again, just a couple of states, that a judge does not need to have personal jurisdiction over a respondent. So please feel free to call us if you want to know which states are involved um, and if you'd like to make some arguments in a personal jurisdiction case. And now we're going to turn to what can advocates do in these types of situations. And really, again, um, it's going to come down to helping Lila obtain legal representation in both the home state and the refuge state. So um, connecting her with attorneys in Tennessee and helping her find an attorney in California. But again, assisting with documenting the evidence um, and gathering things. You can see a list there on your slide of things that can be useful in terms of evidence gathering to help kind of substantiate the domestic violence. Um, and we often sometimes recommend that survivors maybe think about having a secure email or a Dropbox account or somewhere that they can send pictures or messages that's secure away from the abuser 
so that they have those available them to them for ready access or if their phone has been broken or their accounts are being monitored, um, to think about places that they might be able to send that evidence so they have access to it in both states as well. But ultimately, it's going to really pivot on making, seeing if you can help the survivor show the court that domestic violence occurred and, um, and helping her document that through the process. So Deborah's going to talk to you again a little bit more about if Lila can get a custody order um, long term in California. Sure. So the basic rule is that the refuge state can only get involved in temporary orders or short-term orders. But there are a couple ways in which the refuge state can do more and can get involved in entering a long-term custody order. One way is if a particular set of things happen related to an emergency order. And the UCCJEA says that if an emergency order states on its face that it will become a final order someday and nothing ever gets filed back in the other home state, then an emergency order can indeed become a long-term order. Now we know as a realistic matter this doesn't happen too often. Typically if there's an emergency order like a protection order in the refuge state, uh, pretty shortly afterwards or even before, the perpetrator is going to file for long-term custody back in the home state. So we're not suggesting that a court in the refuge state can trump jurisdiction from the home state, but rather if nothing happens, if things stay quiet and that temporary order says on its face that it's going to become a final order, then it will be possible for that refuge state to, once it becomes the home state, for that emergency order to become a final order. Again, not a typical situation. A more typical situation that we're going to discuss in a moment is where the home state court decides to decline jurisdiction based on inconvenient forum. So in our situation, that would be the state of Tennessee. It's the home state. Lila perhaps gets an attorney in Tennessee to work with her, and the attorney makes an argument to the judge in Tennessee explaining why the court should transfer jurisdiction to California. We'll talk about that standard in just a moment. We also very briefly want to mention to those of you who are attorneys on the line that there's an argument called an unclean hands argument that comes up in a different type of situation. The type of situation where the unclean hands doctrine applies is where, for example, a perpetrator takes the kids to a new state unilaterally and maybe hides the kids out until they've been there for more than six months and then files for custody in that new state. Because of the perpetrator's misconduct, taking the children unilaterally, hiding the children, the fact that um, the children have been in the new state for six months and that the new state has become the home state, that there is still a requirement under the UCCJEA that that new home state has to give up jurisdiction because of unclean hands, also known as declining jurisdiction by reason of misconduct. So if you have a situation where there have been bad acts by one, one of the parties that have resulted in a new state gaining jurisdiction, that would be the type of situation where you can make an unclean hands argument. But I want to turn now back to the more common scenario, and that is the inconvenient forum scenario. So again, inconvenient forum is something that can be raised either by a party or an attorney or by the court itself, where the court in the home state decides whether or not to give up jurisdiction to a more favorable forum. The UCCJEA lays out eight specific statutes and judges are mandated to consider and make findings on each of those eight factors. The very first factor is whether or not domestic violence has occurred and which state can best protect the parties and the child. So remember back at the beginning of the webinar, I suggested that having evidence of domestic violence can be useful in a jurisdictional argument. Here's an example of where that can really help. If a judge uh, hears testimony or has evidence, criminal convictions, protection orders, 
um, the sorts of evidence that come up in protection order cases as well, if a judge has that type of evidence in an inconvenient form argument, then the party is going to prevail at least on that very first factor. One of the other eight factors, the fourth one, talks about the relative finances of the parties. So in a situation like Lila's where conceivably Lila is not going to be employed once she goes to the new state and where typically in domestic violence cases the perpetrator is exercising control over the family's finances, that would mean that the survivor also could potentially prevail on this factor in an inconvenient form argument. Even if she is the one who's left the state, if she doesn't have any money and he is employed and has a job, the relative finances of the parties would suggest that the judge in the home state should transfer jurisdiction to the new state. There are six other factors as well, and one of those factors is which state is most familiar with the issues involved and the parties. What that means is that if courts have already frequently been involved with the family's life, let's say through protection order hearing, child protective services case, maybe a paternity case, that would weigh in favor of the state that's already been involved in the family's life keeping this custody case. And you can imagine why. It's really a matter of conserving judicial resources. For any of you attorneys on the line who would like to try and make an inconvenient form argument in a case, feel free to contact us. We've got a lot of case law about inconvenient form and also some sample pleadings that your colleagues across the country have shared. We are finding increasingly that judges are willing to listen to inconvenient form requests and to even permit, we've had some very nice success recently where we've heard from some survivors and some attorneys we've worked with that courts have permitted uh, the case to be transferred to the new state after a judge went through an inconvenient form analysis. Just to be clear, the request for inconvenient form has to be made to the judge in the home state. That is not a decision that can be made by the judge in the refuge state. And now we're going to turn to what can advocates do in these types of situations. So as Deborah mentioned before, um, really, again, helping the survivor contact the court in the home state to obtain case information or see if anything that has been initiated there is going to be paramount. Um, even if um, case records are typically visible online, we do suggest calling because sometimes ex parte motions or protection orders aren't things that are visible to the public. Um, we also, as she mentioned before, tell survivors that it's critical to find out if the parents filed for custody within that six month window. Survivors may erroneously think that if they're not personally served or if they're able to evade service that the case cannot proceed, but there are many alternative service methods that the court may allow the case to progress without the survivor's knowledge and participation, even if she hasn't been personally served. So that's one of the reasons why it's so important for the survivor to, to be aware of that case is has even been initiated in the home state. So helping her find an attorney in the home state, helping her connect to the court, even connecting with a legal advocate in the home state can sometimes help with that if she's not familiar with or able to navigate the court process by herself. Helping her find out if she can participate by telephone and for hearings in Tennessee or if she can apply for continuances over the phone until she's able to um, get an attorney that can help her there to make an inconvenient form argument or represent her in the long-term case. So sometimes participating by phone may be the only economically feasible option for the survivor. Um, so finding out if that's even possible. We do find that that, again, varies by judge and jurisdiction. Um, so it's really going to come down to finding out if that's possible in her particular situation in that particular location. So um, we're going to move on to our next question. And that is, um, what if Lila is required to return to Tennessee to litigate the custody case after having relocated safely to California? So we do sometimes see that survivors um, are required to respond. We see that judges typically respond to, these, to this in three ways. 
when um, survivors have fled with their children and the abuser has filed back in the home state. So the most restrictive response that we see from judges is when a survivor is ordered to return the children to the home state. And although the court cannot order the survivor herself to return, the court does retain jurisdiction over the children and can order that they be returned to the home state, which in practice means that the survivor is ultimately probably going to return with them. We do see this happen, and because the judge in the home state is going to be the judge presiding over and making the final custody order in the case, unless somebody prevails on an inconvenient form argument, it is going to be important to comply with court orders entered by the home state. Um, the next we see is the most generous, and that's when a judge permits the survivor and her children to remain in the refuge state. And we see that the survivor is represented in the home state, and upon that attorney's motion, the judge in the home state relinquishes jurisdiction on the basis of inconvenient forms. So as Deborah was previously discussing, an attorney makes a motion in the home state, in this case Tennessee, would decline jurisdiction, and Lila is able to proceed with a custody case in California and remain there um, with her children safely. The third kind of scenario that we see in these situations is um, kind of a hybrid where judges may permit the survivor to remain safe in the refuge state with the children but do not relinquish jurisdiction of the case. So in these cases, the survivor may be permitted to appear by phone or video conference, but sometimes they may be required to appear for court hearings in person. And it, again, it's going to vary, like I said, whether judges will permit survivors to appear by phone or require them to return. But in these cases, uh, the custody case would proceed in the home state, even though Lila and her children are able to remain safely in California. Um, so that can still sometimes be a good option if the survivor is represented in the home state, even if they don't prevail on an inconvenient forum motion. So in these situations, what advocates can really do is ultimately knowing what judges in your county may, may do with regard to these three scenarios prior to giving any advice on whether the survivor should leave the state with their children. Uh, of course, we always recommend that a survivor talks with an attorney in the home state before she leaves to know if she's and of course going to be in violation of any parental kidnapping laws, but also if she is going to be ordered um, back if she is able to legally leave, because that could be a possibility. Um, and also suggesting that uh, attorneys and even advocates are familiar with what judges typically do in terms of allowing survivors to participate by phone so that you can provide them with that information as well. So we're going to move on, and Deborah's going to speak with you now a little bit more about relocation. And if any of you have questions about what we've said regarding the UCCJEA or any of the other topics we've covered, please feel free to submit them via the chat, and we will uh, get to those as we go along. But for now, we're going to turn to the issue of whether or not it's legal for Lila to leave the state with her children. And we're going to consider very briefly two final sets of laws. One of those are relocation laws, and the other are parental kidnapping laws. One thing that I think might be interesting, given that we have advocates and attorneys from across the country on the line, is I'm going to ask you, if you know what your state relocation law is, to give us a quick little summary on the public chat so we can get a sense of how these laws compare to each other. If you don't know, that's fine. Go ahead and look it up when you're finished with this webinar, and you'll know for the future. But starting with relocation laws, what they do really varies by state. So in some states, the relocation laws set forth a standard that a custodial parent has to meet before moving. In other states, they cover situations regardless of whether or not there's been a custody order entered. Some relocation laws apply within the state to situations where someone is moving out of state only, and others apply to moves within the state. Sometimes they're phrased as if, if a parent moves more than 60 miles or 100 miles or 150 miles from their location, then they have to comply with the state relocation law. Recently, we've updated the relocation laws on our website, 
And so this answer about where relocation laws are found is an interesting one. In some states, they're codified by separate statute. It might be called relocation statute or change of primary residence, something like that. In other states, there's just a little provision that's part of the custody statute itself. It's part of the best interest analysis, and there's one or two lines about relocation. In still other states, there's no statutory language at all, but there's a whole um, list of cases that set out case law standards that judges have to consider if a party wants to relocate. So if you're an attorney working with a survivor who wants to relocate, we really encourage you to become familiar with the, either the case law or the statutory standards in your state. It can be so useful to survivors to be able to get permission to move out of state and to start over in a new location far from the perpetrator um, that even though these, case, these arguments are hard to make, it can be really worthwhile for the survivors with whom you're working. So, and we mentioned there are, at this point, I would say virtually all the states have some type of relocation law. There may be one or two um, that do not. But, but in fact, the relocation laws in recent years have really multiplied, and unfortunately, they have gotten a bit more complicated in many states. So, as I mentioned, in some states, the relocation laws required the existence of a custody order to be applicable, but increasingly, the state relocation laws are also including situations even when there is no custody order. And what do they require in different states? What they require is varies, again, from state to state. Sometimes there's just a simple notification required of the other parent prior to moving out of state. And sometimes there's a whole process in place. Uh, in terms of looking at the statutes, it, it varied in some states, literally, there was one paragraph about relocation, and other states might have an eight-page relocation law. So it's quite different from state to state. In some states, the parent who wants to relocate has to contact the court and get permission to move. And in other states, uh, it's up to the parent who received notice of the relocation from the other parent to object to it and to go back to court if they don't want that per the other parent to be permitted to move. In many states, there's a list of factors that a judge has to consider prior to permitting the custodial parent to relocate. So again, sometimes they're very specific to the relocation itself. Often they talk about maintaining a relationship between the left behind parent and the child and how that's going to be done. In other states, there's a requirement that in addition to looking at these relocation laws and factors, that the judge has to also consider all of the factors in the best interest standard. So to give you an example, in the state of Pennsylvania, there's a relocation statute that contains 10 different factors a judge has to look at. But then it also refers back to the custody law in Pennsylvania, which contains an additional 16 factors. So as you can imagine, having a judge look at 26 different factors in a relocation case really means it's going to be useful for survivors to have attorneys when making these types of arguments. There are some states where domestic violence is included as a factor, but not all states. In terms of the burden of proof, that also varies quite a bit by state. Sometimes the relocation laws require the relocating parent to show the move is either in the child's best interest or a higher standard to show there are exceptional circumstances. And sometimes it's the reverse. It's the non-custodial parent who has to demonstrate why the move is not in the child's best interest. So some things to look at when you're examining your own state relocation statute. They follow. You can see them on the slide. When is the, when is the relocation law triggered? Is domestic violence a factor a judge needs to consider? What steps should a parent take before moving? What about if the parent doesn't comply? And of course, what is my role as an advocate? So now we're going to talk a little bit about some of the real life um, circumstances that these relocation 
laws pose for survivors. So one thing that we see, because we're always trying to find attorneys for survivors with interstate issues, is that it's very difficult to make these arguments without attorneys, but many legal aid programs are unable to represent clients in post-custody proceedings such as relocation. And as you've heard, these relocation cases can be a little bit time intensive, so it, that's another deterrent to programs that are overloaded handling these types of cases. There's also the issue of confidentiality, and, and clearly in these cases where there's been a high level of lethality in the past, that's why the parent is relocating. So requirements that the survivor disclose a new address to the, par to the other parent who's been abusive can be very difficult. Of course, there's always the possibility of asking the court to keep that information confidential. And many states now have address confidentiality programs that can be brought to bear as well. One of the biggest risks for a parent who's been a survivor of domestic violence who wants to relocate is that some of these state laws or the attitudes of some judges mean that if the relocation is requested, the judge may end up changing custody to the other parent. That's something that's explicitly written into many of the state relocation laws. Another hurdle is that parents are supposed to be aware of these standards before leaving the state, but what we find is that many pro se clients believe that once they have a custody order, they're free to leave the state. So as advocates and attorneys, you will especially know that there may be these issues around the state relocation law or around parental kidnapping laws that have a, have a more difficult standard. It's not just about having a custody order. And finally, most of these relocation laws require the relocating parent to take steps before moving out of state. As most of you know, separation can be one of the most dangerous times for a domestic violence survivor. So taking these steps, if, especially if someone is living in the same house with the perpetrator, can be very dangerous in a physical way, notifying the other parent of the plan to move out of state. We wanted to also share with you a bit about what we found when we've looked at many, many relocation laws across, cases across the country. And that is that typically the courts are willing to permit relocation if there's a prior criminal conviction of domestic violence by the other parent. Now we know that in many of these domestic violence cases, there may be a reluctance to utilize the criminal justice system, or perhaps it hasn't worked for survivors in their particular local communities. But that is something, if there's a criminal conviction on the books, that appears to be persuasive to judges in terms of their assessment of the risk and the need to permit someone to relocate. Another reason that judges increasingly are permitting parents to relocate, whether or not there's been domestic violence, is when there's a specific job offer in a new state. Not just the possibility of finding um, good work in a particular state, but an actual job offer that's on the table. That is something that can be really useful when making an argument asking a court to relocate. And finally, to the extent that an attorney or a survivor can explain to the judge how the relationship between the left behind parent and the children is going to be maintained, that is something that virtually all judges are concerned about. So as we increasingly rely on technology, things like Skype, um, telephone visitation, summer visits, and holidays, that can be something that persuades a judge that relocation is necessary. We also want to mention that there's some case law out there that says if the left behind parent does not object initially to relocation, they can't come back a year or two later and raise that issue with the court. That's just in, in certain states, of course. So again, taking a look at what courts are, how courts are determining relocation factors they will be looking at their own state relocation law. We've seen a couple of judges who are kind of looking over at the states next door and seeing what are the enumerated factors in those state relocation laws. They're almost always also looking at the best interest standards in the general custody statute in the state. And finally, they may be looking at the Model Relocation Act which is um, something produced by the American Academy of Matrimonial Lawyers. The good news is that some judges appear to be granting permission to relocate more often now, and I think that's particularly because 
many families are moving around and many parents are getting jobs in different states. So that's something increasingly that's coming up before the courts. And we've just mentioned a couple of other things. As in all domestic violence cases with which you're familiar, sometimes the courts and relocation decisions are saying that there hasn't been enough domestic violence, it's not serious enough, or there's not enough evidence of it. And so for that reason, they're denying these requests uh, to relocate. Now we're going to turn very briefly to Yes, and I see some commentary in the, in the public chat about that. Now we're very briefly going to turn to the issue of parental kidnapping laws as we wrap up here. So primarily with parental kidnapping laws, as was kind of stated before, the most frequent question that's asked is, in terms of can I leave the state with my children, it's going to be important to understand that the civil laws regarding relocation are a factor, but also that each state has some kind of law that says, some type of criminal law that says when you're allowed to leave the state with the child. And there can also be these criminal repercussions when a parent takes the child from one state to another. These laws go by different names. Um, sometimes they're referred to as parental kidnapping laws. Sometimes they're referred to as custodial interference or ch child concealment laws. Um, but ultimately, it's going to be an, so important to connect a survivor with an attorney in the home state, um, even if she's already fled, I re we certainly recommend having a survivor speak with an attorney back in the home state too to see if she's in violation or might need to return to the home state for any reason. Even if a survivor is free to leave the state, we also suggest that she speaks with an attorney about what type of access to or information about the children she's required to provide to the abuser so that she doesn't violate any child concealment laws. Um, the consequences of leaving a ch with a child in violation of these laws can be dire. The survivor could be subject to criminal charges and could jeopardize both her short-term and long-term custody. In the short term, even if the charge is ultimately defeated, a survivor may lose her kids during the process and be incarcerated in the home state. So as um, we kind of said before, sometimes a parent can leave the state if there's no custody order in place. In others, flight might be criminal even if there's no order in place. So it's important to keep in mind that even if a survivor has sole physical custody, she should still speak with an attorney prior to leaving the state because despite having that sole custody, taking the children out of state could still be a violation of criminal parental kidnapping laws. Um, in terms of what protections there are for survivors, they do vary by state. Some states have exemptions, some have defenses, um, but many uh, do provide express protections for DV survivors. A handful of states have exemptions to their laws, such as California or Florida, and some have established defenses that can be invoked, um, unfortunately, after the survivor is charged. So again, just to reiterate, speaking with an attorney before leaving the home state, um, and even if the survivor has already fled, and in particular, let's use Lila, even though she's already in California, contacting an attorney in Tennessee and finding out Tennessee's parental kidnapping laws is going to be really important to make sure that she didn't flee in violation um, or doesn't need to return so that she isn't going to have any criminal repercuss repercussions of having taken the children out of state. I did want to quickly circle back to a couple of the questions that were on the chat, too. Um, and I think Deborah's going to clarify a little bit on that as well. But I wanted to reiterate that um, in terms of legal services and pro bono legal aid, I know that that can be so difficult and that survivors often don't qualify. And I did um, share a few tips earlier in the presentation for some ways that might be helpful or that might be able to kind of persuade legal services to take a case. Um, but we certainly would say making those connections and working with those local agencies is going to be very important, especially when survivors don't have the economic means to hire a private attorney in these cases. Great. Thank you. And I just wanted to get back to two of the questions raised earlier. Amy had uh, briefly answered, I'm not sure everyone saw in the chat, the question about 
about whether it's the same if someone wants to relocate from town to town or county to county within a state. And that's really going to vary based on the state relocation law. What I can say is the majority of relocation laws do not appear to apply so much to moves within the state, at least to moves very close closely related geographically to the original location within the state. And they tend to apply more to out-of-state moves or moves that are quite far away, several hours. The other question was, are there ways for the laws to be simplified? And the answer is yes. There definitely are ways for these state relocation laws to be simplified. What we're really seeing, though, is a trend in the opposite direction. But we're happy to talk to any of you who would like um, to discuss some, some, let's say, sample state laws that perhaps are a little bit um, more clear or have an easier process or a, a simple list of four to five factors rather than a more complicated state law. So we've, we've got some ideas about things that are also happening in a positive way in the state laws. Just to give you one example and, and end on a high note, there are some state relocation laws that typically require notice of the other parent but have very specific statutory exceptions for when there's been a history of domestic violence. So sometimes they're phrased as if there's a valid protection order in effect or if there's been a criminal conviction, then this requirement um, for notice of the other parent is waived. And we're happy to share those, those samples with you. You can also go on our website and take a look at the relocation laws and other laws as well. OK, and I see there's one more question um, about a survivor who called to find out if the perpetrator had filed anything and was told by the clerk's office that they would not speak to her over the phone. We have heard that very occasionally from time to time. I would say in the vast majority of jurisdictions in the country, it is now possible to call over the phone and get that information, or even to go online and get that information, although we caution you that sometimes there's some lag time between someone filing something and it making it into an online database. Um, so we still prefer the calls. One technique that can be used is if a survivor gets a particular um, answer, she can call the next day at a different time of day. She may get a different court clerk who may have a different response. We are doing some education of court personnel 